Our second reading today is from the first Corinthians. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory, Glory to, to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus came down with the twelve and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, to you O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So as I said before, for Paul, the resurrection is the answer to our universal problem. So we, got, we have to kind of know what the universal problem is. And so... There's really no way of talking about this without kind of doing a kind of a, a swath of the larger arc of Scripture here. And as I said, I'm going to try to do all of this in 12 to 15 minutes. And so well, there's more to this. Because in order for the good news to truly be good news, we have to understand the bad news first. In order to understand God's answer to our universal problem, we first have to realize and understand our universal problem as scripture sees it. And so that's that larger arc. So we got to go all the way back to the beginning. <clears throat> so in Genesis, God created the world and God created humanity to be in relationship, in relationship to each other, in relationship to nature, in relationship to God. And, but Adam and Eve and humanity chose to not be in relationship to God, to not follow God's way. They chose to choose for themselves between right and wrong. That's eating from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They chose to decide for themselves between right and wrong. And because they decided to choose for themselves and not, for God, not have God form that, then they had to leave the garden. Because in the garden also was the access to the tree of life. So they had to leave the garden because who would want to be in that broken relationship forever? 
And so sin came into the world when they wanted to choose between for themselves right and wrong and not follow in God's way. And when sin came in the world, death came into the world too. Okay? So sin separates us from God, and then death is the final separator. And because humanity doesn't choose God, we very quickly make a mess of things. For in chapter, Genesis chapter 6, 6, God is grieved and sorry God created the world to begin with. I mean, it's pretty quick. It goes pew, pretty quick. And the rest of the Bible, the rest of the larger arc of Scripture, is God's rescue plan to get us back into that relationship, into how it should be. So it starts with Abraham and then on into Israel. And time and time again, they do not choose God, but choose themselves. They keep but God keeps that relationship going. I mean, it really starts with Abraham, with God choosing Abraham and promises to protect him and give him a land and a people. And the first thing Abraham does is lie to protect himself from the Egyptians. Right after being promised life and safety and everything. And it keeps going. And after God frees uh, the people from slavery from Egypt, and right after receiving the Ten Commandments and, agree, and agreeing to follow them, they decide to make a golden calf and worship the golden calf, something they had made, not the God that freed them and not the God that had rescued them and give them the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, give them the Ten Commandments. And throughout the desert journey, as they're wandering in the desert journey, they go through a cycle of they're complaining that all we have, first of all, they complain they didn't have food. God gave them food. Then they complain that all they had was this manna. And then, you know, so time and time again, they are complaining, they get in trouble, God sa helps them, and then it keeps going time and time again. And then in the book of Judges, which is the book that we're going through pretty quick today in confirmation, they go through this cycle where they're choosing for themselves how they want to live. They get in trouble. They complain to God, they wail and cry out to God. God raises a judge to help them. The judge frees them. Things go well while the judge is still alive. And then the judge dies, and then eventually they choose for themselves, and they get in trouble. Then they wail to God. God raises a judge that saves them, and it's just a cycle. That's the book of Judges right there, time and time again. And the prophets, especially in Micah and Amos and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, are constantly telling the leaders to stop trusting in themselves, stop trusting in political alliances or their own wealth, and trust in God and follow God's promise and God's way for caring for the poor and the needy. But time and time again, they trust in themselves and their political alliances. And eventually those alliances that they've made turn on them. And the people they got in alliance with to protect them from being enslaved end up enslaving them. And the cycle of oppression starts over. And so the prophets came to realize that it was not really our actions that were the problem. It was our inner nature that seems to always cause us to choose ourselves over God. And so it's not that we do bad sins. It's not that we do bad things or we don't do the good things we're supposed to do. It's the fact, as the prophets will say, that we have a hard heart. For example, in our reading from Jeremiah today, even when there is a clear choice between trusting in God or trusting in ourselves, being like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream so that they stay green and never get anxious in the time of drought, or being like a shrub planted in the desert without being able to live up to its potential, we seem hell-bent on choosing ourselves. And so life is not what it should be. So much so that Jeremiah continues in our reading and saying that even our heart, the thing that we use to tend to trust to help us make decisions, can trick us into making the wrong decision. The point is, 
from the beginning of Adam and Eve's choices all the way through our choices today, death has reigned supreme because of our sin. Because we constantly choose ourselves between right and wrong, good and evil, and not God's way. The fact that we are so self-focused is what's behind the great commandments to love God with all your heart, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. To choose for your neighbor and desire for your neighbor the kind of life you would choose and desire for yourself. And why none of the Ten Commandments talk about the self. They are all about God or community focused. Because for the Bible, the overly focused or heightened sense of self in exclusion of the world around you is the root of our problem. Luther called this in Latin... And I had a professor that told me if it's Latin, it must be true. (laughs) Incurvatus in se, which is curved in on ourselves. Or another way of saying it, being navel gazers. Imagine that image. We're just walking around bumping into people and realizing, oh my goodness, there's someone else in this world. This is sin. And we seem unable to change it. And this leads to death. Death of all kinds. Physical death, but also death of relationships and death of potential and death of how life should be. According to the Bible, this is our universal problem. That we are so self-focused that we decide for ourselves between right and wrong. We have a whole bunch of people in this world deciding for themselves between right and wrong. And if you look at the world we've created, you see that much of the problems and tragedies we face, it's because people are still loving themselves more than others. Now, don't get me wrong. I do get that there are other tragedies in this life. There's mental illness and cancers and other things that we seem to not have control of, other not right things. But these are only a small part of the tragedies we face and the deaths we experience in this world. The reality is, just look at your own life and relationships. We are either dealing with the consequences of our overly self-focused ways or that of others. And the truth is, we seem unable to stop this. It is so embedded in us. It's almost written on our hearts that we can't fully change even if we wanted to. Or as I'm reminded of the old Lutheran confession that I grew up saying, I believe almost every Sunday. It seems that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. And so for the biblical prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, since the problem was our heart, the solution was for God to give us a new heart. Then God will give us a new heart and a new spirit. God will take our heart of stone, as, Jer- as Ezekiel talks about it in thirty six twenty six. And give us a heart of flesh. So much so that Jeremiah will say in 31-33 that God will write the law on our hearts. But as long as death is present, sin is not defeated. So for Paul, God's response to sin is not the cross. I totally missed something in this sermon. (laughs) That is so weird. All right, so I'm going to back up here. (laughs) Because this curved in on one's self-sense even extends to Jesus. When Jesus comes, when God comes in the flesh to show us the way God intended life to be, 
our system and our world that we've created is so turned around that these blessings and these woes seem so not the way life is. And we try to like spiritualize them and not actually consider that the way we've created life actually devalues people because we place value in the wrong places, because we place value and meaning in ourself, in our station, in our status, then we devalue others and we create systems that keep those things going. And so Jesus, when Jesus says, woe to you who are rich, we think to think, oh, well, that's not really talking about us because, well, A, I'm not rich, or B, whatever it might be. We try to get out of those. But the reality is we create these problems and there is a, there's the way life is that certain people are benefiting and certain people are not. And when the kingdom of God comes, when life becomes the way God intends it to be, there's going to be a leveling. That's a reality that goes on. And, but what happens is when you get that, Jesus becomes uncomfortable. You can't, when you can't push it away and spiritualize it and change it and massage it away the way you want, then you've got one op- two options. You have change your heart and follow Jesus in the way he's talking about or get rid of the guy. And that is what we did. We do not like God's way. We are so self-focused enough that we would rather kill Jesus than to warm up to his teachings. And I know we would like to think that if we were back then, we would make the same decisions. We would make a different decision? No, we wouldn't be the ones that would scream, scream, crucify him. But if you're honest with yourself, no, we wouldn't. We are very comfortable in the way we like to view our lives. We are very comfortable in how we have structured it, and we are correct. And so, no, thank you. So for Paul, the answer to our sin is not more death. For Paul, the answer to our sin is the resurrection, is life. Remember, the consequence of sin is death. And he says that in Romans 6.23. God's response is resurrection. God's response is to not allow the death we cause to have the final word. And so if Jesus is not, <clears throat> has not been bodily, excuse me, bodily raised, it is, if it is just a metaphor or a symbol, then death still reigns supreme. And we are still in our sin. If Jesus has not been raised, we are, we all, all we have is this life. This life we are experiencing now, where we are dealing with the consequences of sin. If Jesus has not been raised, life does not get any better for this ever. Because the people trying to be the solution are the problem. If Jesus has not been raised, then God doesn't desire life. Isn't tied to this world the way Genesis speaks to it. If Jesus has not been raised, there's a power more powerful than God. If Jesus has not been raised, then those who have died are gone forever. They are dead. They are dead, dead. And we will never be reunited with them again. If Jesus has not been raised, then there is no hope for the future. Because life will, be, will continue to be just one damn thing after another. And then you die. So then there is no reason to follow the Ten Commandments or the greatest commandments to love God and love neighbor. Because it's all meaningless. If Jesus is not raised, 
then life just becomes nihilism. And we should just get what is ours while we can now. Hoard and accumulate and do everything we can to do that. To elevate them ourselves above all else. Because after this, there's nothing. Or as Paul says in verse 32, we might as well just eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. The resurrection is God's response to our universal problem. For our heart can only deceive you as long as you live. Sure, Paul is actually going to continue to go on and say in other books where we can experience the resurrection life as we die and rise in the waters of baptism. And that's discipleship, which is why we're going to talk about it during Lent. But the ultimate good news and the power and the promise of the resurrection is God's final redemption and restoration of all things. Where there will be no there, there will be a new heaven and a new earth where God will wipe away all tears from all faces and death will be no more and mourning and crying and pain. The consequences of our sin will be no more. For these first things, this life, this body of death, Paul talks about, will have passed away. That is why the bodily resurrection of Jesus is the foundation for the good news. Because as Paul ended our section today, what happens to Jesus will happen to you. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. And so Jesus was raised. And we too will be bodily raised, and only then will we and all of life be restored. Because the first, the problem of our hearts, that innate thing will, with us, will have died with us, and we will be raised anew. And maybe what that looks like is what Paul talks about next week. The resurrection is God's answer to our universal problem. Amen.